Well, hello, everyone. My name is James Sanderson. I'm the evangelism minister here at the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. And it is April 1st, but no, no April Fool's, you know, going on here. We're dealing with the Bible, and it's the real deal. And, um, boy, I got a story for you today. We have been going through a series of God's love story. This is actually lesson number five. We're just starting from Genesis 1 and just kind of working through, hitting some high points. Why are we doing this, you ask? Well, we are really trying to connect the dots and to show um, people how this whole Bible connects. A lot of times we get bits and pieces of the Bible, but we don't know how to put it together as a puzzle and then stand back and go, ah, oh, I see it. I get it. This is how it works. That's what we're trying to do in this lesson and these series of lessons. So here we're going to get to the story of Moses today. Okay. And we're going to see that Moses was a type, a shadow and a picture of Jesus. And it really doesn't matter where you're at in the Bible. Everything is going to point to Jesus. This is going to strengthen our faith, and this is going to show us that this Bible that we hold in our hands, that we read, is no made-up story. There's no way that all these dots can connect, that just some random person got together and wrote, and then another person wrote, another person wrote. Uh, there's no way they could connect all those dots. And so you can see that this is from God. So I pray this study will strengthen your faith, and you got to stay to the end because the coolest stuff is really at the end all right okay so we've been kind of using the roadrunner and the coyote this tells you how old i am this is the cartoons i used to grow up with okay and we're going to use an analogy here that satan is the coyote and he was always trying to chase the roadrunner which was jesus when god sets a plan in place I don't care who you are, including Satan, you ain't going to stop it. The coyote never caught the roadrunner. Satan cannot stop Jesus and this plan that he has to bring us to this, to, to bring Jesus to this world, to save us from our sins. He can't stop it. We went over this last week in our last week's lesson, that when you look at that Old Testament, before Jesus ever got here, you're going to see that there is at least 330, some say even as many as 450 prophecies, direct prophecies, pointing to Jesus in the Old Testament. But there's also some types, anti-types, analogies, like I said, pictures, shadows. They're said to be 1,500 of those that connect to Jesus in our Old Testament. And again, that just fortifies our faith. And there's a reason that all those are in there. And so again, everything is pointing to Jesus in this Bible. Before he got here, while he got here, and after he got here. So we've been following the seed line, starting with Adam and Eve, right, of Jesus. And so God is working through this line to bring us Jesus. He started with Adam, then there was Seth, Seth to Noah, Noah to Shem, Shem to Abraham, and then Abraham to Isaac. All right? That's the route he was taking. That's the seed line prophecies to bring us Jesus. From Isaac, Isaac married Rebecca. Rebecca and Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob, but God was working through Jacob. Jacob, one of his wives, was Leah. Leah had one of her sons was Judah. And this was how God was working the seed line to bring us Jesus. But there's some other lines that are also mentioned in the Bible. And one of them is this priesthood line. All right. And I had forgotten that this, these verses were in the Bible. So this is, this is good review for me to help me to remember. Oh, yeah, that's right. 
in Exodus 6, it talks about this line. And in verse 19, it says, The sons of Merai and Malai and Mushai, these were the clans of who? Levi. Ah, Levi, according to their records. Amram Ram, married his father's sister, uh, Joacheb, Joachabed, there we go, who bore him Aaron and Moses. Am, Am, Amram lived 137 years. All right, boy, some tongue twisters there, I'll tell you. So you can see how through Levi came Aaron and Moses, okay, the brothers. That's where we're trying to take the story today. So when you get down here and you see Leah, Leah not only had Judah, but she also had a son named Levi. And from Levi, from Jacob to Levi, is going to connect to Korath, and Korath to Am Amram, and Amram to Moses. Now the priest line is going to go through Aaron and then on down. So we want to see how Moses came about here, okay? So he's kind of connected to the priest line, but he's not because it's going to work its way through Aaron. It's going to take that route. Our focus today is on Moses. Exodus chapter 1. All right, so let's see about the Israelites here. And now they are going to be oppressed. Now, again, if you haven't watched the videos in this series uh, that I've given before this, you need to go back and watch all of them. You really need to start with video number one and work your way down through God's love story and watch all four videos and then come back and watch this one because the connections will make a lot more sense. So verse 6 of Exodus 1 says, Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became extreme, exceedingly norm, normous, numerous, so that the land was filled with them. It's going to be one of those tongue days. All right. So what happens? Where did we see Joseph last time? Well, Joseph was there, right? He comes second in command of all Egypt, right? There's a great famine, but they've been storing up grain. That forces Jacob's brothers to leave Israel, come down for grain. They eventually go back and get their father Jacob, and the whole bunch of the Israelites move where? To Egypt. So now they're in Egypt, okay? And now they're starting to fill the land. They are growing and growing and growing. Verse 8, then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Well, who were the kings in Egypt? They were pharaohs. So now we got a new pharaoh. He didn't know Joseph, okay? He wasn't friends with him like, like Joseph was with the pharaoh that he was with. So he comes along and he says, look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies and fight against us. And I don't know, take over our country. Verse 22. So Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born to you shall be cast in the river and every daughter you shall save alive. What's this Pharaoh saying? Kill the babies, the male babies. Take them out, right? So this, so they don't get too numerous here. That's what he wants done. There's a Nile River. He wants them thrown into the river. There they are being oppressed. Chapter 2. Now we're going to run into Moses and his birth. Moses is protected as a child. And then Moses fleeing to Midian. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman. Levi, the tribe of Levi, right? We're following this line now. 
from from Jacob to Leah to Levi. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, he hid him for three months. She hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no more or no longer, he got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch, and then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. So she is hiding this baby. She doesn't want her baby to be killed. <coughs> so mom puts the child in this basket. There's a picture, okay? I think we know the story pretty well, all right? So there she is. She's trying to hide the child so the child does not get killed. Now, here's some similarities between Jesus and Moses. Just like they tried to kill the baby Moses, they also tried to kill the baby Jesus when he was a baby, right? Sure enough, that's right. Herod, right? Okay, you see the connection? This is called an anti-type. All right, it's a type, but it's anti because it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. Here's another one. Just like Moses was protected by God as a baby, right? Because they fled to Egypt. He protected them there. Or, or, I'm sorry, just like Moses was protected by God as a baby, right, in the basket, so was Jesus when he was a baby when they fled to Egypt, his parents. Verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of it, heard of what? Well, here's Moses, and he's growing up in Pharaoh's household, okay? That's where the basket went, and his mother gets to take care of that child in Pharaoh's household. And Pharaoh grows up in Pharaoh's household. Now, somewhere along the line, he learns that he is a Hebrew. He is he is one of the Jewish people. But he's living in Pharaoh's household, right? And he sees how the Jews are being mis or the Hebrews are being mishandled, mistreated, okay, as slaves. And he sees this Egyptian really giving uh, one of the slaves a hard time. This uh, angers him. And he actually kills the Egyptian and tries to bury him in the sand so nobody will know about it. But guess who found out? Pharaoh. He heard about it. So he's wanting now to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of where? Midian. He is now in Midian. He sat down by a well. Now the priest of the of Midian had seven daughters. And what's Moses going to do? He's going to end up marrying one of those daughters. Okay? So there's the story. So here's the map. So here's Moses over here in Egypt. Flees over here to Midian. Okay, so it's now over here, Midian, flees over there, and now he lives over there. He's protected, okay? So just like Moses fled to Midian to escape, Jesus fled to Egypt to escape. Okay, so again, some more similarities. God's protecting them. So these are some anti-types of Jesus and Moses. Now we're going to go all the way to the book of Acts. And sometimes you got to do this, and that's the beauty of the Bible. I love this verse in Psalm 119, verse 160. It says, the sum of thy word is truth. And sometimes you don't get the full picture in the text, but you have to go other places. Well, where are we going today? We're going to go listen to Stephen, and he is going to preach about Jesus but he's going to talk about Moses, okay? And he says in chapter 7, he says, When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his fellow Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Well, I just told you about that story. But here's what Stephen tells us that the, that the book of Exodus doesn't that Moses was 40 years old when this happened, okay? And I think that's important. <coughs> Excuse me. 
from Moses' birth to when he fled to Midian was how long? 40 years. Okay, So that's how long he grew up in Pharaoh's household until he had to flee for his life. So he got 40. Chapter 3. Here we're going to run into the burning bush. Now remember where he's at. He's in Midian. Okay. Verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. So his father-in-law is Jethro. He's taking care of the sheep, the flock, right? And he led the flock to the back of the desert, and he came to where? Horeb, the mountain of God. Now you're going to see that the mountain Horeb and Mount Sinai are interchangeable in the Bible. They're the same mountain, okay? The mountain of God. So here he is. He's up around this area. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So here's this bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush wasn't consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. It's burning, but it's not It's not like um, being dissolved. All right? it's, it's, it's still there. Okay, So this gets his attention. He goes over there. And what happens? And the Lord said, so the Lord is speaking through the angel of the Lord to Moses. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. God says, look, I care about those people over there. They're my people. I started building a nation through them. Okay, I haven't forgot about them. And what does he want to do? I want to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prezerites, uh, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. A lot of ites. Yes. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of their children of the Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I'll send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of the land. That's what he wants to do. Verse 21, And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask her neighbor, namely, of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. You shall plunder the Egyptians. Now, this has got to be interesting to Moses. <laughs> I would think he's got to be saying to himself, wait a minute. These guys are slaves. Okay? They have nothing. Uh, I watched them. I lived there. Okay? And when these guys finally get let go, they're gonna they're gonna take silver and gold and clothing and they're gonna plunder the Egyptians. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. You know, it's the same way with the gospel. The gospel, in a sense, doesn't make sense. Here we are. We come along and we do bad things, and yet. God gives us good things. Do you know what that word is in the Bible? It's called grace. Grace gives you something good when you've done something bad. You don't deserve it. A slave doesn't deserve the good things. But here God is going to give them the good things. You're going to be made rich, right? One minute you're a slave, next minute you're rich. That's what God does with us. He brings us out of our slavery of sin through his son, and gives us grace. And now we have the riches of heaven. Being God's child. Being allowed to live with him forever. That's what God does. But we don't deserve it. We were enslaved with sin. You see the picture here? Are you seeing the connection between God and us? And who is in the 
center of all that picture there, Jesus. He's going to make all of this possible. Pretty cool story. All right. So here's Moses. This is what's going to happen. Well, Moses doesn't want to go. He's like, yeah, I can't do this. There's no way. I'll find somebody else. Well, here's a connection between Moses and Jesus. Moses eventually is going to go. So God sent Moses to save Israel. Well, God sent his son to save us. Do you see a connection? Sure you do. You got it. Now back to Acts. Another timeline here. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Wait a minute. Exodus said it was Mount Horeb. That's right. Same. Same mountain. It's not a contradiction here. Okay. But how old was he when he went up on that mountain and saw this bush? 40 years old. So there was 40 years from the time he was born to when he fled to Midian and another 40 years while he was in Midian and he goes back to Egypt. So 40 and 40. He is now 80 years old when he goes back to talk to Pharaoh. Okay. I'm sure these people were in a lot better shape at 80 than we are today. I think the world was a little different then. They lived longer. Chapter 4, Moses returns to Egypt. Verse 21, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all the wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my who? Firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. All right. So who is God's firstborn here in this picture? It's Israel. Okay. There is firstborn. Hmm. Well, he's had a lot of other people born in this world before these guys. What you're going to see when you start studying this out is, is that this is a thing of status. Okay? God is building a nation through Israel. And so they are his firstborn. Okay? Uh, you'll see David. King David is called the firstborn. <laughs> King David had a, he was the youngest of a bunch of brothers. He wasn't the firstborn. But there's a status there. Jesus is called the firstborn. He was not born. He was not created. This is a place of status. The book of Colossians says he is firstborn over all creation. That means he has status. He has authority. He has power because he is creator. He is before all things. He is the firstborn over all creation. It doesn't mean he was born. Okay. My point is this. I want you to see this. What did it take to get these people redeemed and bought out of their slavery? What's it going to take? It's going to take the firstborn to die. God says to the to Pharaoh here, look, if you don't, uh, if you don't let my firstborn go, I'm taking your firstborn. And when he finally takes their firstborn, that's when Pharaoh says, get out. They were redeemed, bought out of their slavery by the death of the firstborn. We too are bought out of our, sla out of our slavery by who? The firstborn, Jesus. He is before all things. Do you see a connection? I knew you would. It's amazing how this Bible comes together. Now, chapters 7 through 12. These are the 10 plagues of Egypt. Let's just talk about them briefly. So what's the first plague that we see that God is going to bring through the hand of Moses onto Egypt? 
Well, the Nile's going to turn to blood. Okay. In fact, all the water in Egypt was going to turn to blood. And what happened to those fish? Do you see them? They're all going belly up, aren't they? That would be a major disaster. They're losing food and they've lost their water. Okay. And they can't drink it. Um, wow. That's a pretty major event to happen to the what? The most powerful nation on the earth. Egypt. But he ain't going to let them go. God's like, okay. Let's go to round two. And we're going to have some frogs. Those frogs are going to be in your bed, Pharaoh. And they're going to be in your bread. How would you like to bite into a piece of bread and be chewing on this guy's eyeballs? Ugh. No. Can you imagine the heaps of frogs when they died and how they were heaped all over Egypt? And the stench? Oh, it must have been terrible. But he's not going to let them go. Then what happens? Now we're going to turn all the dust. God's going to take all the dust of Egypt and turn it into gnats. It's about the best picture I can get as having gnats okay they're just ugh. and they're everywhere i mean literally everywhere pharaoh's not gonna let him go he says no not this time so what does god do now he brings in flies you got dead fish you've got dead frogs now you've got the gnats and then the gnats are flies and they're everywhere. Just a miserable place to be. Boy, something has happened to Egypt. Still don't let them go. So what happens then? Well, then you've got the livestock. Okay? And now they are being plagued. And they are dying. And they're laying dead all over your nation. Not good. Again, the stench bad still not letting them go god's like okay now we're going to go after the human now they're going to have boils all over their body Can you imagine the pain and having those all over your body pharaoh's like sorry ain't letting them go god's like okay let's bring down some hail good hailstorm is going to do what? Well, it's going to destroy your crops. Okay? So there it is. That's what hail does. It's going to take out your crops. Still not letting them go. Okay? Well, whatever crops is left, these guys are going to take care of it for you. They're called locusts. And there's going to be a locust plague. And I'm told that a locust plague takes seven years to recover because when locusts first go in and eat everything, they plant their um, their uh, eggs and so they're going to hatch and come back and I hear it takes seven years to recover from a, a, a plague of, of uh, locusts Pharaoh's like sorry I'm not letting them go okay why don't we shut off the lights for a while we're supposed to have an eclipse here in a couple of days um, 2024 of April I think it's April 8th next Monday um, just shut the lights off, okay? And this wasn't an eclipse. This was just utter darkness. Well, Pharaoh's like, no, nah, not letting them go. Okay. So then we get the plague number 10. And what do we have? The firstborn of every Egyptian household, anyone who did not have the blood of the lamb over their door, like the Israelites did, and all of their animals will die in one night. Can you imagine the wailing that went on in this nation? Can you imagine all the dead people? All right? That's a lot of dead people. Pharaoh finally says, get out. Get out. Well, here's my question here. Why was God doing that? What was he doing? It's The answer is here in chapter 12, verse 12. 
On that same night, I will pass through Egypt, strike down every firstborn, who? Both men and animals. And I'll bring judgment on who? All the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. He was destroying the gods of Egypt. I'll take that sun god. I'll turn him off for three days. Now you tell me who's God, right? I'll take your Nile god and I'll take your fish and turn them upside down. I'll kill them all. You tell me who's God. And he just kept going right down the line, right down the line, right down the line. He is trying to give a message to some people here. Both to the Israelites, that I am God. And to the Egyptians, that I am God. And to the world, because you don't think that this message didn't get out to the world, because this is the most powerful nation on the planet. Yeah, God's trying to get a message out. Well, there's another God to take out. Who is that God? It is Pharaoh. Now, I think this is important to bring out. This is going to be a little fun study here. I said, hey, stay with me until the end here. Let's talk about Pharaoh for a minute. So we're going to look at Pharaoh Ramesses II. And we're going to talk about dating and finding the Pharaoh that spoke to Moses. Now, if you grew up when I grew up, you grew up with this movie right here, The Ten Commandments. In this movie, Ural Brenner is going to play Pharaoh. And in the movie, he is referred to as Ramesses the second. Okay? And that's who everybody says is the Pharaoh that spoke to Moses. All right? Here is his picture. He's to believe to be the guy that wouldn't let the Israelites go and is having this conversation and dealing with Moses. But there's a problem with that. I'll share that with you. In Psalm 136, verse 15, it said, But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. All right? Now, I was just reading the other day where it said that Pharaoh escaped and went back and told the Egyptians that, you know, that he, that, uh, you know, the army is dead. So he was the only one to escape to go back and tell him that. Well, it says in the book of Exodus chapter 14 that everyone who got swept into this water died. Not one of them survived. Well, who was in that water? Pharaoh. Guess what? He died. Okay. Here's what I find to be a problem. The problem is this, pic the problem is this picture right here. This is Ramesses II's mummy. Not his mommy. His mummy. Okay. And if he, first of all, Ramses II, he doesn't fit the timeline, okay, to be the pharaoh. That's one problem. And the second problem is, is if we've got his mummy, how would we have his mummy if he died at the bottom of the Red Sea? It's going to be kind of hard to, to retrieve him and bring him back and then mummify him when he drowned with a whole bunch of other Israelites. I mean, how are you going to, how are you going to sort him out of that pile? So for that reason, I don't think this is the guy that spoke to Moses. I know the world says that. I don't think he's the guy. Problem number two is this. I bet you have a little map here of See Egypt down here, I've got it circled, and this is Megiddo, which is farther up to the north. It talks about this Ramses II, and it says early in his reign. Now, how long did Ramses II reign? He reigned for 66 years, a long time. He's one of the longest, if not the longest, pharaoh that ever reigned in Egypt, okay? It says, early in his reign, he met with the ruler of Asher, Asher, up on the Megiddo border. Who is Asher? Asher is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. So if this is the guy that actually let him go, well, what happened after he let him go? Well, they went out and traveled over here for 40 years in the wilderness. 
if it's going to take them 40 years to go around that wilderness and then go back up here and get in the land, there is no way that he could have uh, met with the ruler of Asher up in the Megiddo border early in his reign because Asher ain't there yet. They're still out there traveling in the wilderness. They haven't even got to the promised land yet. So for that reason, I'm going to say this ain't the guy. He's not it. Okay? You see my logic here? So I'm going to say he's not the guy. All right? For those two reasons. Now, here's what I want you to see about the current Egyptian timeline. As the Egyptian timeline stands presently, there's not one event of the Bible that matches. So therefore, people use that against Christianity. And they say, hey, your Bible's flawed. Claiming the Bible is, is, is fraudulent. Okay? Not to be trusted. Here's the Egyptian timeline. And everything that is measured in Old Testament time. If it's Bible or not Bible, it doesn't matter. Anything that happened during those times is always measured by this standard, the Egyptian timeline. Now, I want to let you know, the Egyptian timeline has been changed already four major times. So, if it was wrong four times, could it be wrong a fifth? Well, let's see. So, when using our Bibles, okay, if you're just going to use your Bibles to date things. The dating of the Exodus should be 1440 BC. That should be right where it lands at, okay? I want you to notice these two pharaohs and where the Egyptian line places them. Watch these two guys. This is his name is Pharaoh Antamentant the Fourth. I want you to see where he reigns at. He reigned in the 12th dynasty. Here he is right here. Okay. There's this picture. And he reigned between 1815 and 1807, I think. He didn't reign a long time. Okay. But that's when, that's the dating. Sorry, my picture's in the way here. That's the dating for when he lived. And you can pull this up on the internet. Okay, that's where they got him placed at. All right. 12th dynasty. Now, let's look at this Pharaoh Ramesses II. Okay. We've kind of been talking about him a little bit. He is in the 19th dynasty. There he is, Ramesses II the Great. And he lived, he reigned on the Egyptian timeline from 1279 to 1213, I think. Some, something like that. Right right in there. Okay? And he's in the 19th dynasty. See it? Okay. So that's where they got him placed. As the timeline stands today. When you look at the Egyptian timeline as it stands today, you will notice that there is a large section of pharaohs missing from the 13th through the 17th dynasty. Just don't have any, just don't have any pharaohs. They're just like they're missing. Okay? Could it be that these sections of history actually never existed? Right? I mean, there's spots for all these pharaohs. You can pull it up online and see them. There's no pharaohs there. They're just, like, missing. Hmm, that's interesting. In fact, there was an ancient book that was written back, I think, maybe in the 50s. And these, I think it was four Egyptian scholars that was really looking. I don't know if they were actually Egyptian, but they were looking in Egyptian history. And they're like, man, we got, like, 500 years of Egyptian history missing. And they wrote a whole book on it. Okay? If so, you have a 242 years of Egyptian history that can't be accounted for when you take these pharaohs out. Then you add in another documented, in other, in other documented discrepancies with the Egyptian timeline. These are documented now. And you add those in. And it shrinks the timeline even more. It brings that pharaoh closer and closer and closer 
and by adding the evidence together, that would put Pharaoh Antimenton IV at 1440 BC, making him the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And that's what my Ted, my friend Ted Stewart, uh, sorry I didn't capitalize Ted there, discovered in his many years of research. Okay, so there he is. He's since passed away. He was one of my instructors at Sunset, a wonderful, loving man. And he wrote this book, Solving the Exodus Mystery. And so he gets in there and he shows where this timeline is off. Okay? Now, when he puts it all back together, guess what? Every event of the Bible fits perfectly right where it should be. And now the Bible and history match up together. That's what he did in that book. It's an amazing book. Now let's go back to Pharaoh Antimenton IV. If this is the guy, let's see what Egyptian history says about this guy. Well, there he is. According to Egyptian history, this Pharaoh didn't have a tomb. Well, the other Pharaohs did. Why doesn't he have a tomb? Oh, well, think about it. <laughs> If he died at the bottom of the Red Sea and all that water came crash, crashing in on him, you don't need a tomb. There's not going to be a funeral for this guy. Is that making sense? Ah, it is. Oh, and guess what? Guess what Egyptian history says what happened to this guy? How did he die? <laughs> Egyptian history says he died by pouring of water. Well, if you got the Red Sea crashing in on your head, would you call that pouring of water? That fits pretty well. He did have a firstborn son. Now remember, in Egyptian history, firstborn son would always take the reign. That was just that was just something they normally did. But not in this case. In this case, his wife took over. Well, why didn't his firstborn son take over? Which we know he had. Oh, wait a minute. The firstborn of every Egyptian household died in one night. He can't take over. He's dead. Now you tell me if Egyptian history isn't matching with the Bible. Spot on so far. Oh, but wait. There's more. <laughs> now, look at this headpiece. Now, this is King Tut. This is a headpiece that they would wear. I want you to notice what's on top of Pharaoh's headpiece here. This is the goddess of the cobra. What the cobra goddess did was the protector of Pharaoh. Okay, very good. So there's Pharaoh. Gonna protect him. Oh, you can see it right above his head there. He's got something right there, okay? And then... What's this other one? This is the vulture. The vulture is the vulture goddess, and this is the protector of children and their birth. Can I ask you a question? How well did that goddess work out for him? Not very good. What was God doing? Destroying all the gods of Egypt. Didn't protect his son and didn't protect him. Because what happened? Pharaoh died at the bottom of the Red Sea. Now, let's look at one more. This is a priest. Impure, okay? An Egyptian his, uh, priest who lived during the time of Antimenton IV. He was a scribe. He lived during the reign of Antimenton, and he wrote about the biblical plagues of Egypt. He says in Egyptian history that the Nile turned to blood. Did you know that was in Egyptian history? Probably not, because this guy doesn't fit the right timeline, and so they don't talk about this guy. He also wrote about the three days of darkness. That's what the Bible says. History, Bible, matching up. You see it? 
and the firstborn of every Egyptian household died in one night, and they filled the Nile and all the tombs with their bodies. That's what this guy wrote in Egyptian history. That's what the Bible says. And he lived during the same time as this Pharaoh. Now, you see that matching up? That's amazing. That's amazing. Wait a minute. There's more. So he writes about all these plagues. It's, it's, it's matching up perfectly. This is his wife. Wonderful woman. I guess she would be a beauty queen if you like women without noses. Okay. All right. Um, she took the reign, according to Egyptian history, after her husband died. Okay. Egyptian history tells us that there was total chaos in Egypt. Uh, the priests were marrying the prostitutes and vice versa. It's not normal. Okay. Uh, the gold was ripped out of the tombs. Uh, that's definitely not normal. In fact, she fled to the southern part of Egypt, and that dynasty came to an end. And then other people literally came in and took over the nation of Egypt. That's right. Why would all that happen? Well, let me tell you, <laughs> your army's dead. There's nobody to protect your cities, right? Um, your country is decimated. You've lost all of your slaves, uh, your food supply and everything. Um, boy, does that not match the Bible? Yeah, it sure does. It sure does. And then the last God of Egypt was destroyed. And who was that? It's Antimenton the fourth. God was taking out the gods of Egypt to show the world that he and he alone is God. And that's exactly what Exodus 14, 4 says. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, the Israelites. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all of his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. God says, I'm the Lord. Not your gods, not your Pharaoh, not your Nile, not your son. I am God. And guess who ended up going with those Israelites? Other people of Egypt, the Egyptians, they left with them. Said, we're not staying, we're not following these gods. We're going with the God of heaven. And they followed. Did God care about those people? He absolutely did. Can you see here how Moses was a type of Jesus. Absolutely. And we're going to see a lot more of them. In fact, here's just a list that I pulled off of the internet. But there are so many things here. And you can just go back and slow down this video and just read all the, all the way through here of all the connections between Moses and Jesus. And it's amazing. You can't make this stuff up. So it doesn't matter where you're at in the Bible. It all points to Jesus. I hope you can see that. I hope this is strengthening your faith. And I hope you stay with this series because we are going to see this more and more and more as we go through this Bible. I pray you've been blessed. God bless you. I'm praying for you. You pray for me. And let's never, ever miss who Jesus is. He loves you. He came to save you. Follow him with everything you got. Hey, we'll see you next time. God bless you.